we'll we'll continue with the phrase structure and complement and adjunct distinction uh, quickly reviewing uh, from yesterday we have looked at these three aspects of a category uh, there are three layers of a category one is the lexical layer intermediate layer and then phrasal layer all of them are going to be in all the phrases are going to have these layers and each one of the category noun verb adjectives and preposition will follow this follow this system where the words are always at this category the reason why we need phrases and is because we need to accommodate more stuff that are related to heads in a phrase we have in a noun phrase we have a noun as a head and then we get it potentially we can have a specifier of a noun which can be a determiner and a complement which can be an np itself or a pp and then there are rel specific relationships between these these elements that become crucial for how sentences work this is what we have been trying to look at and we are looking at this the, the relationship between these elements and categories with respect to the distinction between complements and adjuncts how do we find whether a particular phrase is a complement or adjunct is what we are going to focus on today so like i said every phrase will have these three things specifier head and a complement not necessarily they each position is filled they may be empty but they will have a space for the for the three things the crucial thing between a complement and a head is they are non recursive and i'm going to talk about it uh, i'm going to talk about what it means to be non recursive and what it means to be recursive as well uh, but the relationship between the head and the complement is non recursive there is a role of intermediate category in us understanding the distinction between head and complement and a complement and a specifier that also will be highlighted so we were looking at some of these examples i want to stick to the example so that we understand now i want to draw some of the structures of these phrases probably that will help us understand these things better uh, so the the first one help help me draw this thing and please look at look at it how the how the structure develops so we have the first phrase the king of england so in this phrase the head of this noun is king which is a noun and this is the head okay the specifier of this noun is the determiner the and the complement of this phrase is an np sorry is a prepositional phrase a pp which is 
of England. So, look at it, look, look, look at this phrase now, how it works. Again, this will have an specifier, a p bar, a head p and its complement, which is going to be an n p. And in that case, this n p, since we are doing it uh, to understand the structure, let me elaborate the structure to see how it really works. Again, this is this will have an specifier, a head, noun and a complement and then the preposition is of and then here is we have the noun England. This is the full representation of this noun phrase, the king of England. Now, I want to draw your attention to several specifics of this, this phrase. You see this determiner is way too high in this structure. There is, I, right now, I am mentioning about high and low and the hierarchical relationship in non-configurational terms. There are terms for terms for these things, which I want to introduce to you at a particular stage. But the reason why I am only saying it is high is everything else in this phrase, look at this, everything else is in the scope of this determiner, this has specifier. This is why it is, it is too high. And this, this, this provides a specificity being a, def, being a definite article to the entire phrase. Okay? Then when we start looking at the smaller segments of this phrase, we see that uh, here is the head and then there is a sister relationship between head and its complement, which happens to be a pp in this case, which is a prepositional phrase. Again, when we look at the structure of this pp, it is consistent with the phrase structure that we have been trying to understand, where every, every phrase will have a similar pattern, similar structure, which is specifier, head and a complement. Now, look at this pp. This whole thing is the complement of this noun and this it has an specifier, head and again a complement of its own, which is the complement of this head, which is a preposition. There is no specifier for this phrase, therefore this place is empty. There is then when you look at the specifier, when, we, when you look at the complement of this p with preposition of, then you see it happens to be an np, a noun phrase which is England. And in this case, there is no specifier and no complements, both. However, it retains consistency in the structure of, of phrases. And what it also retains is the relationship between one another. Look at, look at this, how complements are related to their heads. In each, configura in each configuration, at each stage, the relationship between the head and a complement is of equal. You see, you see, you see that? Where the head noun of the entire phrase king takes its complement, its ancestral relationship. Everything that is dominated by this pp is in the scope of this noun and everything else is the complement of this noun, which is this pp. Then when we further go and see this pp is headed by a preposition which has its own complement another NP. 
and when we elaborate that NP again, we see that in the head position of this NP, a, a, of this, right, of this NP, we have a noun which does not have a complement. Okay? Now, similarly, you can work on the structure of a student of physics. It is going to work exactly this way. Where the difference begins is when we want to look at adjuncts in the example of a student with long hair. And again, bear with me for a minute. I am only saying complements and adjuncts and I am going to show you how do we find out that the one PP becomes a complement and the other becomes an ad adjunct in a moment to you. Now, let us work on the third one. Uh, student with long hair, how does that work with in this, in this whole structure? So that we know that this is not a complement, this is an adjunct. Okay? Uh, let me work on that with you. Again, we have this whole thing is nominal in nature, therefore, it is an NP, it has an specifier and then head, which is a noun. What is the specifier in this sentence? A, which is a determiner A and the head of this phrase is student. Okay. Now, we are saying that this is a, this is not a complement of, sorry, student with long hair is not a complement, which clearly means that this PP is not going to be here, because this is not the position for a, for an adjunct. This is a position for what? A complement. If this PP was a complement, then this is where we get it. Then the question is, where do we, how do we represent this thing structurally, so that we can denote the distinction between the two? The, the way it works is this. So, I am going to quickly do this thing for you. Do you understand this structure? What is the difference between this structure and this structure? That is this, let me, let me call it A and call this one B. What is the difference between A and B, so far that you see? Uh, in B, uh, after after the first sentence, it is the um, head with uh, adjectives and uh, with the other branches complement. I, I, I thought it will be much simpler than that. It, the difference is, we have two of the intermediate categories here. You see that? Two of the intermediate categories. The role of the intermediate category is to provide recursiveness to the structure. That is, if you need more space, add one more. Okay? However, once you are decided that we have reached the terminal node, this cannot be expanded further. Once we know that we have reached the head noun and then whatever is going to come here is going to be the complement, this does not branch any further. So, this configuration is non-recursive and this configuration is recursive. Okay? That is, the relationship between the head noun and its complement is non-recursive. That is, that non-recursiveness is brought into this thing to to capture the idea that 
we cannot have more complements. However, once we have, uh, however, recursiveness does exactly the opposite. It provides a space for more and more elements in the fridge. Okay? So, uh, now this the determiner he, specifier here is the determiner A and the head noun is student and here, here comes the adjunct P T. It does not come in the complement position and then it goes again to the spec So, what do we have here in the PP? Uh, what comes here in the head position of this phrase? We are working on the third one from the screen width. There is usually there is no specifier in the prepositional phrases. Sometimes you will see that that place is also not, not listed, but we are, we are listing it for simplicity and for us to understand that uh, it should be, uh, that, that every phrase follows a consistent structure. And the complement of this preposition is a, an NP again, which is Oh, we have little bit more than that here. Long hair, student with long hair. So, what do we have that? Sure. Long is an adjective. So, this could, this is an adjectival phrase. Okay. Uh, I, at this point, I do not want to take you into that discussion, but long is long hair is also called, also argued as a noun phrase where long is just the modifier of the of hair but that 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 discussion is a completely different thing right now for us it's not not relevant we can call it a adjectival phrase or a noun phrase now if it is an adject, adject, if it is an adjectival phrase what will be in the head position of this phrase what will be in the head position of the phrase long long and then where does the noun go? Complement. As the complement of that head, which is which will be adjective, and then again it will have its own phrase, and then the hair will go to the head position of that NP. Do you see how it how the how the structure works? Right? Similar issues again in this kind of a phrase, the specifier has the whole thing in its scope. This head, this is the head of the uh, main phrase where this PP serves as, a, as an adjunct. Now, once we have, now let us look at the fourth one, student of physics with long hair. Should be pretty simple for you to do. Where? of physics comes in this place of a complement and with long hair remains away from this configuration. All right? So, we, we then we still maintain the distinction between a complement and an adjunct. Get it? On purpose, I want to introduce verb phrase as well just to show you that the way we have been looking at noun phrases and its complements and adjuncts, the distinction of a complement and adjunct works within the verb phrase in the same way. Okay? There is absolutely no distinction in terms of its structure, in terms of their structural representation. That is structural representation of, uh, of a complement and adjunct in the verb phrase. Look at the verb phrase here. Uh, I, I 
in a, in a, as a matter of fact, I don't want to just take it for granted. I want to show you at least one of them. The, if I say, if, if we work on the structure of a view, verb phrase, the way it works is, again, we have an, a specifier and a B verb. And here is the head verb. What comes, we are working on the first one, John loves Mary. What comes in the head position? What is the verb here? Loves. Loves. So, right now, we are going to put both. But you know that there is a distinction between love and loves. What is the distinction between the two? There is some other element associated with the verb when we say loves. What is that element associated with it? Number, Number or tense or something else. Please keep in mind that when we say terminal note, right now I am going to put it here. When we say terminal note, that is a lexical category, that category does not take anything else other than itself. So, in a way, this, this category here, we should not have this. That is, whatever that element is, number or tense, that goes somewhere else. And hopefully, if, if not today, in the next class, I will show you where that goes to. How we separate these elements from the lexical categories and how they combine together to make a sentence. Remember, we are working on a verb phrase right now. That is, and I, I told you in one of the beginning classes that verb is the center of a sentence. It hosts everything th and that is how it becomes a powerhouse. So, for the time being, let me put loves. Okay? Uh, and then we have a complement, which is what? So, the more we work on these phrases, we stop writing complements. We know that this space is for complement. So, we only put what? What is the complement of this verb? Mary. Mary, which is what? A noun phrase. See, in the complement position, we cannot have a terminal category as the, as the complement. That is, here we cannot say that we have just a noun as the complement. Complements must be a phrasal category. Therefore, we have an NP and then again it works the same way where we have a terminal node as noun and then it becomes Mary. Okay? Get this thing? In the second one, Mary will meet with her doctor at 5 p.m. The word phrase is, will meet with her doctor at 5 p.m., right? So, okay, hold on. At least this one, again, I want to show you how it works. Okay. So, we have a VP. There is, there is no alteration in the elements in a phrase. That is, we will have a specifier, this cat intermediate category, and then this far. Okay? We see that with a complement, we have something else here. What do we have? The complement is with her doctor. And then there is another, another. Uh, okay, so first, first of all, tell me what's the category of this complement with her doctor? What's the complement of this? What's the category of this complement? What's the phrasal category of this complement? PP, and we have another PP at 5 p.m. Right, and that PP is not a complement because we can have just one complement in this case. So, this is, this is how it is going to work 
the way we have seen the earlier noun phrase. We, sorry, we will have a V here, terminal thing, meet. And I am dropping right now the tense part will. Uh, that that I'll show you some other time uh, when we are working on the full sentence. Meet the complement is going to be the PP, and without elaborating this complement, I am just going to put it this way. With the doctor, you can you can expand this thing. Can't you? Yes, no? Yes. And then we have another PP here at 5 pm, which is going to be the adjunct of this phrase. All right? This structure or the recursiveness and non recursive nature of this structure guarantees us that we can have more than one adjunct in a sentence, rather n number of adjuncts in a sentence or in a phrase, but we cannot have unlimited number of complements in a sentence. That is the most important takeaway point here from this structure. Is this clear? Then comes the point that how do we know that a really a, a particular a particular phrase is a complement or an adjunct. They are pretty simple. Uh, and uh, when I tell you about those things, you are going to realize I already knew them. This is the structure that we were working on yesterday. Do we understand this structure in a better way today? We have we have the whole head with the determiner as a specifier A and this is the distinction that I, were, I was asking you last night, la yesterday, where you see this being recursive and this is the whole point of this intermediate category. You can see that this, 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 this node is called N p, it is a phrasal category because the, in the head position of this, uh, this whole category we have a terminal head which is a noun but and, and and so is true for everything else but there is nothing this intermediate category is not a terminal thing this intermediate category is only for providing us recursiveness in the structure i uh, do want to mention this to you that i have i have not taken you through the historical development of how people worked on these, these structures. When for the first time this whole thing came into existence, this was not binary branching trees. They had several, several branches and there were reasons for that. that. That is not in my understanding, that is not important for us to understand what, how did it look historically and then. Uh, however, what is important for us to know is uh, what are the advantages of binary branches? Uh, probably uh, next week when we look at two more issues in syntax, I am uh, fairly aware of the introductory nature of this kind of a class. So, I am trying to keep it within the limits, but when, when I introduce two more uh, uh, aspects of syntax, then probably I will be able to tell you the relevance of binary branching in a little bit better way. And this recursiveness here in this structure tells us that this PP is a complement and the second PP is an adjunct. Clear? So, this is, is this structure clearer today? All right. Now, let us go to see uh, the, disti the distinction between complement and adjunct. I want your attention to the ungrammatical sentences. Uh, which are with transitive verbs, uh, do they sound ungrammatical to you? When we, when someone says John will imitate, is that un incomplete? Does this sound incomplete? Uh, Mary will abandon. 
Does this sound incomplete? Uh, Tim will reconstruct, right? What is missing in, in these verb phrases with the transitive verb? What is missing? The object. the object. In the traditional grammatical structure, we, we could have simply done away with this object. We do want to put this idea that these objects are actually complements. What we know as objects are actually complements. So, the, the reason why these three sentences with transitive verbs are ungrammatical is because the complements are missing. And without a complement, we can have a sentence, we can have a verb phrase without a PP, without an adjunct. But if this is missing, then the sentence leads to ungrammaticality and unacceptability. So, here, here we start, how do we know the complement, how do we know whether a, a phrase, prepositional phrase is really a complement or an adjunct. And also, we want to learn how do we take care of ambiguity in sentences. When you read this, this phrase, a student of high moral principles, this, this phrase can be ambiguous. Okay? This phrase can be ambiguous. This has two meanings and these two meanings are represented in A and B. You see that distinction? It, this phrase, a student of high moral principles could mean student who studies high moral principles or a student who has high moral principles. When it means someone who has high moral principles, then it is really an adjunct. And when we mean someone who studies high moral principles, then it is a complement. So, the advantage of understanding the distinction between a complement and adjunct <coughs> helps us understand ambiguity or at least describe ambiguity, why ambiguities arise and how we take care of those ambiguities. Human mind does not make this mistake at all. However, I do not want to say that this is ambiguities are mistakes, ambiguities are not mistakes, but when we say ambiguity, we mean if we are looking at this phrase, this is ambiguous. When you are telling this to somebody and the way my human mind processes this whole thing is very clear to human mind. It takes just one reading. It may be physically ambiguous, but it take, human mind takes just one reading. When human mind takes the reading of, a com, of uh, this NP as a complement, uh, which is a person who studies high moral principle, then you know how complement com configuration works. When we have a different meaning of this whole phrase, that is meaning B, then the config configuration works like an adjunct. The way human mind figures out this, this uh, ambiguity uh, with whatever speed uh, required is precisely because of this distinction between complement and adjunct. Maybe it is little bit too much at this point to tell you and for you to see that really human mind will be working with these two terms, complements and adjunct, but that is the argument for these kinds of ambiguity in, in this kind of research. Next uh, is, uh, yes, so now we start, now we, now we look at what, what works, how, how we understand about complements. You see, the, way, the first, first way to find out whether a PP is a complement or not, the complement should be close to the verb and the adjunct does not have to be close to the verb. If you try to reverse the order, then that results into ungrammaticality. So, any time you are in doubt, you put another PP there and try to reverse it. If it, if the order is 
giving you ungrammaticality, reversed order is giving you ungrammaticality, then you know that you are inserting another adjunct in the required adjacency between the head and the complement. Are you with me at this point? You have a noun, you have a noun phrase, a student of physics, you want to know of physics is complement or not, try inserting another pp. If that results into ungrammaticality, then you know that you are disrupting the adjacency, required ad adjacency between a head noun and, a, and its complement, therefore ungrammaticality. Are you with me? And that is what the ungrammaticality of B on this phrase, a student with long hair of physics tells you. That is the first test of whether a PP is a complement or not. The other test is located in recursiveness and that goes back to what Aswin you were asking about uh, uh, an NP, that sometimes an NP may not have a complement. We have an, take, a, take for example, we have an N, N, we have an NP, a student with long hair. How do I know that this time this PP with long hair is an adjunct? If it is an adjunct and we put another adjunct and another adjunct, that, that is another PP and another PP and still we are getting a grammatical string, then they are all adjuncts. Here we have this with long hair with short arms in green coat, all of them as all these three PPs are adjuncts. Okay? Now, what, what, what are we trying to say? Suppose we had only this much, a student with long hair and we, I want to find out this with long hair is a PP, is, is, this PP is an adjunct and not a complement. If I put here something which is of the sort of a complement, this structure is going to be ungrammatical. If the following PP is a still an adjunct, then it is it's going to be grammatical and thus we know that the previous PP is also, a, also an adjunct and therefore it is allowing the, uh, think about this uh, recursiveness, the intermediate category, because of that recursiveness, it is allowing us to have more. I have put only three, but you understand that we can put three more here, can we? Uh, and, and that is what I mean when I say arbitrarily large number of times. And that gives you, remember in the one of the first few classes, I had, I, I was talking about a fairly long sentence. Remember, remember about that? How long a sentence could be? How long do you think this phrase could be? Technically or theoretically, how long could this phrase be? Not more than 50. Why? Because you cannot describe a person more than, I mean, theoretically, theoretically, it could be infinitely long. I mean, it would not make any sense. I understand, I, I understand what you are saying. It would not make any sense. Uh, probably we will lose track of what we were talking about, right? If I am talking about a student and we continue talking about that person, I mean this is all, these, these things do not mean anything with long hair and short arms and these, these things do, are, are probably not supposed to, are not giving us the factual details of it. So, all we are saying is technically and theoretically this phrase could be infinitely long. Therefore, we have not even reached to a sentence, I can tell you that we can predict a sentence is also a phrase and therefore that phrase also could be infinitely long. We will talk about that when we come to, come to sentence. Some of you do not seem to be agreeing with this infinite, infinite thing. You do or you do not? You, you, you can very well not agree, that is also perfectly okay. But you understand that theoretically there is a possibility of this being infinitely long. So, but that should be checked with reality also, we cannot describe a problem. No, no, no. no. 
we are, when we are talking about a theoretical possibility, the, by the definition of this theoretical possibility, it is not going to be actually in practice. Nobody, nobody speaks a phrase, nobody uses a phrase in a sentence which is infinitely long. What will be the consequence of the use of a phrase that is infinitely long in a sentence? You cannot have a sentence, we, you will never complete a sentence. If we are going to have a phrase which is infinitely long in a sentence, are we going to ever complete that sentence? Therefore, we, we, you are right that practically speaking, we are never going to be using a phrase which is infinitely long. But that is what we mean when we say theoretically speaking, there is a possibility that a phrase could be infinitely long. And that is captured through the recursiveness, just one small little glitch, it is one small little insertion in the whole phrase structure tells us or allows us to capture this infinity. Okay? Okay, hold on, uh, we will have one more thing. Uh, this kind of recursiveness is not allowed for complements. I guess that's, that should be pretty simple. We, we cannot be saying a student of physics, of chemistry, of uh, engineering, of uh, whatever. This is not, not allowed. That is because the, the structure between, the structural configuration between the head noun and its complement does not allow for further branching. Or keeping this empirical facts in mind, the structure has been designed in such a way that it does not take recursiveness. Uh, the ordering of adjuncts is pretty free. We can change the order of adjuncts in a phrase. We, a student with long hair with short arms can be reversed. However, uh, what we cannot, what we cannot reverse is if we had in, instead of these two, both of them both of them being complement, be, both of them are adjuncts here, right. If we had one complement and the other adjunct, then we will not be able to reverse the order. So, that is another test. Any, any time you have two PPs and you want to check whether both are complement, both, both are adjuncts or not, you can reverse the order and see whether it results into grammaticality or ungrammaticality. The last point is about coordination. You understand coordination? When we, when we add two phrases together, we can only add an adjunct with an adjunct and a complement with a complement. We cannot change the categories in coordination. So, we cannot say student, we, we have to say student of physics and of chemistry. We can, we have to say a student with long hair and with short arms. What is not allowed is student of physics and with long hair. That is a complement and an adjunct cannot be coordinated together. Likewise, an adjunct and a complement cannot be coordinated as well. So, there are three or four very short tests which can tell you how we make the distinction between a complement and adjunct and whether a particular phrase is a complement or an adjunct. Number two, the, this distinction can easily be captured configurationally, which you have seen on this screen. I guess I will respect your time limits uh, and we will stop. We will talk about cases next time we meet.